Good day. My name is Shireen Urtir and I'm from the Conduct of Business Supervision Division at the FECA. With me is Stefani Rousseau. Today we are going to be finalizing the series on competence that we've been hosting. And in this part three, we are specifically going to talk about CPD. Stefani, thank you so much for joining us and for taking us through this very important topic. Thank you very much, Shireen. It's my pleasure to, to be here. So just as Shireen has mentioned, I outlined the previous webinar uh, where we've discussed all the competence requirements and the services under supervision exemption. So in this webinar, we'll be discussing CPD. Again, I am uh, including a link for those of you um, that would like to access the board notice 194 of 2017 that contains all the CPD requirements in that board notice for ease of reference. And then let's start talking about CPD because um, I've been looking forward to this webinar for quite a long time. Um, just to address some of the questions in the sector that we have with regards to, to CPD. Um, a lot of people see CPD as just an additional burden and would do anything just to get the CPD hours and move on and, and focus on other things. Um, but if you apply or if you use CPD, in a correct way, there's so many benefits um, that, that you in your um, work or in your career um, will get from completing the CPD. So what I've tried to depict here is that we're working in a very dynamic environment in the financial services sector. There's change, you have to modify, you have to adapt and shift, transform all the time because of the changes happening. Um, you can also see that now during COVID, there's, there's different ways of doing business, there's different ways of, of, of conducting meetings. So there's, there's changes all the time and we need to adapt as, as things change. So the experience is a great teacher, but it means that we continue to do what we have done before. So a lot of people are saying to me, but I've got experience, years and years of experience. Why do I need to do CPD? Experience is wonderful. It helps you to make good decisions based, based on a lot of experience that you have in the past, but it can also keep you stuck in the past if you keep on doing what, you, what you've been doing um, for years and years. So CPD is creating awareness of the new things happening in your, in your context or in your area where you work and how you can actually use that knowledge to improve on what you are doing. So it's not to say that experience isn't important, but it's important to keep up to date with the changing times as well. So focused CPD activities presents new possibilities, new knowledge and new skills. CPD can result in a much deeper understanding of your profession and a much deeper appreciation of the implications and impact of your work. So the background of continuous professional um, development. Uh, one of the outcomes of the fit and proper requirements um, is to ensure that persons who render financial services have adequate, appropriate and relevant skills, um, knowledge and expertise in respect of financial services, financial products and the function that they perform. So that's what we want to achieve with the fit and proper requirements. So CPD was introduced in order to ensure that FSPs, their key individuals and the representatives maintain their competence. So once you've achieved uh, or you've uh, met all the competence requirements, which is experience, qualification, regulatory exam, if it's applicable, class of business, if it's applicable and product specific, then you need to maintain that, that competence. And that's why I've highlighted that word because it's all about maintenance. Things are changing all the time, so we need to keep up to date. So it's maintaining your knowledge, skills and abilities to remain up to date in a dynamic environment, but also to acquire new knowledge and skills for a changing environment. So it doesn't say just maintain what you have, but also build new knowledge and skills. A CPD cycle runs over 12 month uh, period. It starts on 1 June 
and then it runs until 31 May in the next year or the following year. So you've got 12 months in which to achieve the CPD hours that applies to you. Now, I've talked quite a lot about the section 12 in the, de the, the determination of fit and proper requirements in one of the uh, in the first um, webinar that we did. And again, I want to highlight that section because it's context. Section 12 is an overarching requirement to, that says that FSPs, key individuals and representatives must comply um, at all times with competence requirements. And the competence requirement says that you have to have adequate skills, knowledge and expertise to um, perform your function in terms of the financial categories and um, financial products that you are performing that function. So it's quite a tall order and you won't be able to maintain that at all times if you don't um, use CPD as a vehicle to keep you up to date and to maintain that. So the um, section 30 in the fit and proper requirements also explain the, the huge responsibility that the FSP have in respect of adequate policies, internal systems, controls and monitoring mechanisms that they must have in place to continuously evaluate and review compliance. Now, given those requirements that the FSP must, must comply with, it's quite important that they also have the policy systems, procedures, monitoring mechanisms in terms of the CPD processes um, that is required and that people have to meet within the organization. Um, the competence registers that, that um, FSPs must keep must also include CPD and you cannot comply. It's impossible to comply with the CPD requirement if you don't have systems and processes and resources in place to monitor this at a, on an ongoing basis. Think about your larger FSPs that have quite a lot of representatives and key individuals. Every person, every individual have got different CPD needs. How are you going to identify the CPD needs of the different individuals and what are you going to implement? What are you going to do to identify the uh, or to um, address the gaps that were identified for each of these individuals if you don't have proper processes and policies and mechanisms in place? For smaller FSPs, obviously it will be much easier because there's, there, there's no automated systems required necessarily, um, although it's always good and it's easier to, to um, keep track of things if it's automated. But in your larger organisations, if you have 3,000, 6,000 representatives, it becomes almost an un, unmanageable task to keep track if the proper processes and policies and procedures are not in place. So I'm harping on this because it's really, really important that FSPs apply themselves and apply their minds to what processes and mechanisms can be put in place for CPD to work on an individual level. CPD is not meant to be a chase for CPD hours. It's not meant to be a random selection of CPD activities so that I can comply with the CPD requirement and get it out of my way. It's not in the spirit of why we have um, introduced CPD. The type and the combination of the CPD that you embark on and that you do is very important. It has to address your specific um, skills requirements and any skills gaps that you have. So it can't be a one size fits all approach. It is an individual approach. This is basically what the, the normal CPD cycle will entail. If you, you have to assess the needs of the individual, and this is not in the in the legislation, by the way, I've, I've, I've included this cycle to demonstrate to you how CPD is supposed to work and why it's important on an individual level to actually um, 
monitor individuals in terms of their careers and in terms of their, what they need um, in terms to, to develop and grow. So you, you have to assess the need of that individual, identify any skills gaps or um, developmental areas, plan the learning activities. What is it? How are you going to address that gap that was identified? Then it has to be implemented. Do the training, attend the webinar, read the article, whatever the case may be. Watch my webinar. <laughs> Joke. <laughs> um, um, then review the learning outcomes and the activities. Make sure that it is appropriate and then the knowledge that you have gained. Put it into practice. See if, if how did that benefit you? If you're not putting it into practice, then the CPD doesn't mean anything. And then reflect and review on how you can do the CPD better and what other gaps can be addressed. So that's an ongoing process for each individual. So the CPD must be relevant to the function and the role of the person. That's why you cannot have a one size fits all because not all representatives, not all key individuals and FSPs do exactly the same thing. So it can't be a one size fits all. It has to be relevant to that particular role. Contribute to the knowledge, skills, expertise, and prof professional and ethical standards of that role. Address any identified gaps in technical knowledge, generic knowledge, and the context within which the financial services are um, rendered. And that also includes the legislate, legislation, of course, because if the legislation changes, the person in that regulatory role would have to be aware of it and understand the impact. And then take into consideration changes in, in external and internal conditions. And it's not about meeting and collecting CPD points, just merely collecting it to meet the requirement. And I've repeated myself, but I've, <laughs> it's, it's quite an important point there. So the rationale in, that was applied to work out the um, CPD hours that's required was the risk-based proportional approach. So what, what was taken into consideration was the financial service that is supposed to be rendered in terms of which financial product and what's the risk to the client. So the more complex the product and the higher the risk to the client, the more CPD hours um, would be required. So as I already mentioned, the CPD hours runs over a period of 12 months from 1 June to 31 May the next year. And also, just like with services under supervision, there is a calculation that you can do to reduce the CPD hours if, for example, there's interrupted employment. So, so you, you're working, you're supposed to be meeting the CPD requirement and then something extreme happens and you're off work for three months or four months or maybe maternity leave. Um, the, the actual um, board notice, the, the, the fit and proper, actually states under which circumstances can CPD be reduced. So if there's an interruption in employment, there is a calculation that can be used. And this is the calculation. So what I've done is I've just um, included some example there. The number of annual um, CPD requirements uh, that you need, it depends on the, the, the product that you're appointed for within the class of business. If it's one product within a class of business, it's six hours. If it's more than one product, but in a single class of business, then it's 12 hours. And if you're appointed for products falling into two different class of business categories, then it would be a maximum of 18 hours. I just want to also mention here, it's quite a light touch approach. If you go and look at practices in professional bodies in South Africa, you will find that the minimum number of CPD required um, from people are at least 30 hours or more. And that's the same um, trend that you would find um, overseas as well or internationally as well. So what we've done is, is our maximum requirement is less than half of, of the normal requirement that you will, will get with professional bodies. So it is a light touch approach. Um, so the way that you will calculate it is if, you, if you're supposed to meet the 12 hours, you divide it by 12 and then you times it with the number of months that um, 
you have been absent from work and then you will get the prorated number of CPD hours. OK, uh, then the, an FSP, a key individual and a representative that is authorized to prove appointed for a period less than 12 months in a particular CPD cycle must by the end of that cycle complete a prorated minimum number of CPD hours calculated as follows. Now it's the same example. You again calculate it using the number of hours that you're supposed to meet and um, the number of months authorized approval appointed. So if you're appointed in the middle of a CPD cycle, you can also reduce your, your number of hours. I have listed the questions that we receive in terms of CPD. I have not included the answers in the presentation because this presentation will go on forever. So what I'm going to do is just discuss with you the questions that we regularly receive in terms of CPD and also some of the questions that some of the professional bodies brought to our attention um, that they often receive in terms of CPD. So the first one here is, can any training and development activity be used to meet CPD requirements? Now, given the fact that I've explained to you that the CPD activity has to be appropriate to the function and the role, can any training and development activity be used? The answer is no. Um, it ob obviously has to be relevant um, and that training um, development activity has to be uh, approved by a professional body because they have to allocate an hour value to that activity. Um, they are the experts, they know what the industry um, standards are um, for, for pro professionalism, they know what, um, what is appropriate to the different professions, so they are the, the correct body to actually look at that training and development and to um, approve it for, um, uh, for CPD purposes. But it's important, I want to bring you back, it has to be relevant and it has to be appropriate for that particular role. Can class of business training be recognized for CPD purposes? Yes, there's nothing in the legislation that prevents it from being recognized for CPD. However, if you looked at the webinar where we discussed the class of business, you would know that class of business training is meant to be a once-off training because it, it, it addresses the basic foundational knowledge you need in terms of a product class. So, it doesn't make sense to do class of business over and over again, because once you have that knowledge, you have it. Um, so I have I had a question that says, but if I do see a class of business training for fun, can I claim CPD hours for it? It actually undermines the whole um, reason and rationale for introducing CPD. It doesn't support the fact that you're actually supposed to grow and not to repeat what you've already done, but try and acquire new skills and knowledge. So it undermines the spirit of, of CPD as well. Can class of business training be used for a supervised representative to meet the class of business and the CPD requirements at the same time? No, it cannot be used at the same time. Remember, in our previous webinar where we discussed services under supervision, we said that CPD only becomes relevant to a supervised representative if, if they have already met the class of business requirement. So you must meet the class of business requirement, do the class of business training within 12 months, and only after you've met that requirement are you required to, to then comply with CPD. Uh, why is product specific training not recognized for CPD purposes? The product specific training is ongoing training. It keeps you up to date with the product changes um, that you're responsible for, for selling, for giving advice on and so on. But it was excluded from the CPD because the uh, product knowledge alone is not, uh, is not the only knowledge and skills that you need. And there was a concern raised that if it is included as CPD, then people will only do the, the product specific training and then not really focus on anything else. And I want to use the example that Shireen actually highlighted in our previous webinar, where she used the example of um, healthcare benefits. 
and the changes, the changes that happen to those products, usually yeah, by the end of each year, then your medical schemes um, will start communicating some of the changes that is happening in the following year. And obviously, if you're a broker or a, a representative working with those products, there will be quite intensive training. And it's quite possible that it takes so much time to update yourself on that particular product that that's the only CPD you do every year. But there's other aspects that you also have to focus on. So this was the reason why it was excluded from continuous professional development. Is it correct to say that any CPD activity that was approved by a professional body can be accepted for CPD purposes? Um, it depends on whether that, yes, okay, if, if a professional body has approved it, it means that it is appropriate for the industry. But what is important is that the FSP is still responsible for ensuring that it's appropriate for that particular role, for that particular person. So a, a professional body can look at the content of that CPD and say, yes, it is relevant to the industry, but a particular person, um, it might not be relevant to that particular role of that person. So the FSP is responsible for ensuring and checking that it is relevant and appropriate. Um, then the next question, how many CPD hours must I complete? Please refer to board notice 194 um, of 2017 in part four, where they discuss CPD requirements. And as I explained, if you have one product in a product class, you need to complete six hours of CPD in a 12 month cycle. If you think of, if you attend a, a full day training, um, the the breaks, the tea breaks and the lunch break and everything that you will have, will will undergo in that in that day, will leave you with six hours of training. So that means that it's basically one day full day training, in a twelve month cycle, and you're done. But now you can break it up and, and make it more um, uh, practical for you, uh, depending on your circumstances, by collecting the hours separately and focusing on different things. I just wanted to mention this because if you go on training for one day, you would have met the CPD requirement if it's, um, uh, you know, uh, if it's only six hours. So, so it's not a very onerous requirement. If you then, if you're appointed for a financial product, more than one financial product in a uh, class of business, then it will be 12 hours of CPD. And if you uh, appointed for financial product that falls in more than one class of business, then the maximum is 18 hours. So I'm just repeating it again um, to answer that question. How, how must CPD activities be recorded? Now, that's a quite interesting <laughs> question because it depends on what CPD you're doing now. Um, there must be a record of completion. So um, like this, this webinar, let's take this webinar as an example. You're going to be watching the webinar and you're going to be answering questions after the webinar. So that will be on record as you completing the assessment questions for this webinar and as evidence, verifiable evidence that you did complete the, the, the CPD. So this is an example of how it can be recorded. Then um, why can't I claim CPD hours for completing another qualification? We looked at the competence requirements from a regulatory perspective. And in terms of our competence um, model and requirements, you need to meet the qualification requirement before CPD becomes applicable to you. We then tick that box to say you've got your, your qualification and now you just need to maintain your skills. If you then decide to do a second qualification, you can't claim CPD for that. In consultation with some of the higher education institutions, it was brought to our attention that if this is done, if we recognize uh, qualifications for CPD purposes, then you have a case where some 
um, uh, learners, not everybody, I'm not generalizing here, but learners would register for a qualification, complete one or two subjects just for separate purposes, and then leave the qualification and not complete it. So to avoid any problems in terms of, of that and to create problems for higher education institutions, it was decided that a, a qualification requirement is a requirement that we already tick before you have to meet um, CPD. And for that reason, you can't, when you complete a second or a third qualification, claim CPD hours for that. In the next set of questions, look at how many questions you're in. <laughs> Um, as a member of a professional body, I'm required to comply with CPD requirements of the professional body. Can the CPD be recognized for face purposes as well? Yes, of course, it can be recognized for face purposes as well. Um, again, if it's appropriate and relevant, I can't. Means, uh, highlight that enough, it has to be appropriate and relevant, but we don't want people to duplicate. So if you're doing CPD um, as part of your membership requirement already and it's appropriate and relevant, by all means, it can be recognized for face purposes as well. If I complete class of business training for the fun of it, I, I mentioned this one previously. Can it be? Uh, can I claim CPD hours? No, you can't. Um, you you can claim for class of business training, but you must remember you have to prove that it was relevant and appropriate. So if you've done your third class of business training in a question of a year or two years, you're going to have to explain why you think it is relevant and appropriate still, because it's actually meant to be a once off training. So, so just bear that in mind. Does CPD have to be job specific? Absolutely. CPD has to be job specific because and I'm talking about job in your in the regulatory sense now. So in your regulatory role, that CPD has to be applicable and relevant and appropriate. Um, how does CP, uh, how does CPD add value? So how does CPD add value? I, I started off at the beginning of this um, presentation to actually talk about how it keeps you up to date in a dynamic environment and in a changing environment and how you can actually really hone your skills and develop additional skills um, in your job um, uh, role. What is important is just the attitude with which we approach this because a lot of people are not interested in, in developing any further skills. And like I said, they, they rely on their experience, but it's very quick to, to become out of date. And, it, and it's actually um, good to understand what your peers are doing, what other people are doing, what international practice is, what uh, changes in, in legislation there are, because you get the best, you can give the best service to your client when you do that. Uh, why is the relevant qualification I have not enough? So we're not saying that qualifications aren't enough, but a qualification that you did 10 years ago is not going to keep you current today. So, so it's important your qualification has a place in your competence profile. It's important. It does give you certain knowledge and skills. There's no doubt about it, but it doesn't keep you up to date because once you've completed the qualification, it's done and you need to maintain those, the knowledge and skills that change over time. That's also why qualifications are updated from time to time because the content of the qualification becomes um, out of date or expired. Why are so many CPD hours required? The CPD hour requirement is 6, 12 or 18, as I've explained, and it is not a very onerous requirement if you compare it to the, the standards implemented by professional bodies, bo both locally and overseas. So um, it's not a very onerous requirement. It, it, it will become onerous if you leave it until the due date. If you leave it to, uh, to the last month of your 12 month cycle, then it's going to be difficult to meet. But if you meet it and you work on it um, systematically and you plan the CPD properly in advance to know when do you need to do what, then CPD can actually be a very positive experience. Can I carry my CPD from one FSP to the other? Absolutely. It's not linked to a, to a FSP. It's linked to you in your particular job role. And Shireen uh, gave a very important tip in one of our previous webinars where she said 
keep your records, um, your training, your CPD that you're doing, your activities, keep the record of your CPD so that if you do transfer from one FSP to another, move between FSPs, you actually have a record and you don't rely solely on the record kept by the FSP. Shireen, or do you maybe have any more questions for me in terms of CPD? Stefani, I think you've dealt with the questions um, in a lot of depth and in, in breadth as well. Um, I hope that this has answered the questions that people often have about CPD. One of the things that you mentioned was that people wait until the last minute, and we have seen examples of that so many times with all of the various regulatory deadlines through the years. I think as South Africans, we are a, a nation of procrastinators, and that's just my personal view. <laughs> so please don't say that's in the legislation. But we've just seen that people, due to various circumstances, people are busy. So they wait until the last minute, and then they suddenly realize that, oh, you know, there's a deadline looming, and they have to meet the requirements, and then it's a mad scramble. And that also means that sometimes people do end up participating in CPD activities that are not necessarily that relevant to them. And that's also why people then say, but CPD is not adding value to me. If you plan it, um, and Stefani, you've also mentioned planning. So if you plan it up front, you know that this is going to happen, that your CPD cycle is going to start on the 1st of June and end next year on the 31st of May. Look at the activities and the events that various CPD providers are advertising and choose those activities and events that really suit your needs because my needs are going to be different to Stefani's needs. We don't do exactly the same job. We don't perform exactly the same role. And even if we work for the same company, we still have different needs. Um, and that's where planning your CPD really becomes important. And you can also look at the time impact. Stefani talked about the, the different approaches to doing it in one big shot, like a one day um, workshop that will cater for your six hours, if that is what your requirement is for the day. Um, other people will find it better manageable if they break it down into small chunks. Half an hour and an hour every month or every two months becomes very manageable if you plan that as part of your activities. It's when you try and do it all in the last week of May, then it suddenly becomes a really onerous burden. So. I really want to urge people to plan it, to take control of their CPD, to make sure that it adds value to their lives, because that at the end of the day really is the purpose of CPD, is to keep your knowledge and your skills current and to make sure that it adds value to your functioning within this financial services environment. Stefani, any last thoughts from your side? Shirin, I just want to want to add um, to what you just said because the planning is so important and it will only add value if you're actually doing uh, something that will add value, that you will enjoy, or that, that is relevant, that you feel makes you a better advisor or a better financial planner or, or whatever, but you have to plan it properly. You can't, you can't just leave it to the last minute and then jump and see what you can do because you will not enjoy it and it will be an absolute burden to meet the, meet the CPD requirement. It's been, it was introduced in on 1 April in 2018. So people have now gone through the mill <laughs> at least once. Um, and, and it's clear from, from the feedback that we received as well, people don't enjoy the CPD if it's not relevant to what they're doing. And it's actually a legislative requirement that it must be relevant. So if it's not adding value, it raises question marks about but are you doing something that's relevant to what you're doing? Um, and that's very important. Also, uh, see what your gaps are. Skills gaps is important. You need to understand where the gaps are. Where do you need to focus on? And if you plan for it 12 months in advance, it is manageable and it can be achieved. And um, we're hoping that these webinars that we are hosting will also um, add a little bit of value to you um, when you do your CPD. Thank you so much for that. And on the uh, topic of CPD, we have accredited these webinars for CPD purposes with the Financial Planning Institute. 
So if you want to claim your CPD recognition for attending the webinar, you have to formally register on our website um, under events so that your details will be on the system. And then after having watched the webinar, you have to complete the assessment. Now remember, none of the assessments are set up to catch you out. The assessments are really just to confirm that you did actually participate in the webinar. All of the questions and answers are based on the slides that are used during the presentation. So if you find there's a question or two that you're not so sure about, maybe you nod it off and you need to watch that section again, um, but you will find that it is actually quite easy to answer the questions. Once you've completed the assessment successfully, you can then download and save your CPD certificate both for your own records, and you can then also provide it to the FSP that you're employed by for their competence register. Thank you so much and do take a look at the rest of the webinars. We've hosted quite a series of webinars. We hope that you will at least find a few webinars that are of interest to you. And again, thank you to Stefani for her time and her efforts in these webinars as well. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you.